the current principal at Waterford Camp Club by UWCSA. On behalf of the Waterford Camp Club community, I welcome you all to this memorial service for our dearly departed former principal, Arthur Jennings. When WK received the news on the passing of Arthur Jennings on Saturday, February 10th, 2024, it was deeply saddening. He would have been 94 years wise. A trailblazer in education, Mr. Jennings brought about numerous positive changes to the school, notably the introduction of the UWC movement and the International Baccalaureate to Southern Africa. It is worth noting that both establishments advocate for a peaceful world through education, perfectly aligning Athol's predecessors in our founding principles vision of a just, fair, and equitable world. As the second principal of WK, his legacy lives on. We remember him for his unwavering commitment to excellence. Ton Brent, who will speak later at this memorial, tells me he was a unique leader who welcomed everybody, listened to all, and allowed people to make their contributions and possible and alternative solutions to issues. He was, it was a new way of leading, leading with empathy and devotion to service. At a time when few people would consider excellence in education beyond grades and university entry, Arthur knew that an education worth its while would be that which advocates for developing a deep sense of humanity. It is therefore no wonder that he championed the introduction of a UWC education, which we all have come to appreciate and embrace for helping young people discover that change is possible and that they can make it happen. May he always be remembered for bringing Waterford Camp Club a step closer to education, educating for perpetuity. It is in the words of his students, such as Roger Blackshaw and Lombuso Kodza, that we are reminded of the remarkable contribution he made to WK. And in the words of Roger, and I quote, Arthur gave me the vital support when I needed it, and I will cherish that memory. End of quote. Concurrently, Lombuso says, and I quote, my favorite principle. It is not common for a principal to touch their students' lives in profound ways. He was there for my brothers and I during a challenging time in our lives. May his grace and kindness live on in, on Camp Clover. Wishing his family heartfelt condolences. May he rest in peace, end of quote. These are some examples of the direct impact that Arthur Jennings had on the students at this school on the hill back then. Like a true uwc -er, Arthur not only learned, but also modeled how we can inspire change through courageous action, selfless leadership, and careful listening. Going a step further by enrolling the first female student of color at the college. He was clearly a great predecessor of Michael Stern. And I'm humbled to sit at their desk and live in his house and to borrow from Isaac Newton. If I have seen further, it is by standing upon the shoulders of these giants. It truly was a giant. To the Jennings family, 
we thank you for sharing your father with us. And we pray you find comfort in the knowledge that his legacy lives on through his wondrous works here at Camp Club. We stand with you and we remain and you remain in our thoughts every single day. I now invite the Jennings family to share with us and I thank you all for attending this memorial service. And in particular, my siblings, Mark, Kevin and Karen. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to give you a glimpse into the life of my father and help situate the 10 years that he spent on that amazing hill in some broader context. Ethel Raymond Jennings was born on the 19th of November 1930 in Cape Town. He was the eldest child of Jim and Mary Louise Jennings and his only sibling, Mavis, his sister, was born 18 months later. They lived in Mowbray and in Adderley Street in the centre of town before moving to Johannesburg and taking up residence in Hillbrow. Dad attended Twist Street Primary, ironically the same primary school my mother Pat would attend some eight years later. He attended Parktown Boys High for his secondary school education. It was here that his passion for running started although not in the most auspicious manner. He always joked that the first race he ran in the colours of Parktown Boys High was the 110 yards hurdles, and then he knocked down every single hurdle on his way to finishing last. Fortunately, this didn't deter him as running really was in his blood, as many of us had the fortune, or possibly misfortune, to experience on the hills behind WK. Dad went on to hold the national mile title for eight consecutive years, 1950 to 1957, as well as numerous half mile and two mile titles during this period. He was a member of the South African team that participated in the 1952 Olympic Games, and he captained the South African athletics team in a competition against Germany in 1955. He started his working life as a quantity surveyor having got a Johannesburg City Council bursary to study at Wits University. However, this foray into quantity surveying was not to last long, although, fortunately for us, long enough for him to meet our mom who was assigned to work for him. In 1958, he secured a posting with the Methodist Church to the Indian Mission in Stanga, and was ordained as a Methodist minister in 1962 and so began a lifetime of service to the well-being of others. At the end of 1972, Dad was part of a group of white clergy and laymen who decided to walk from Grahamstown to Cape Town, a distance of some 950 kilometres, to draw attention to the breakdown of family life caused by the apartheid government's migrant labour policy. Their aim was to urge the government to make it legal for every South African husband and wife to live together with their children in a family home. The walkers wanted to focus the attention of white people in particular throughout South Africa during the festive season when families are traditionally together, to the fact that hundreds of thousands of families were forcibly separated by the country's race laws. The walkers' aim was not to accuse anyone, but to confess that they themselves shared responsibility for the migrant labour system, and they invited fellow white South Africans to confess their common guilt for allowing such a situation to continue, and to commit themselves to trying to change it. Throughout his life, after being ordained as a minister, even when he wasn't assigned to a parish, Dad provided support to local congregations, such as the one in Imbaban, district circuits, and national synods. 1974, Ethel Jennings moved with his family to what was then Swaziland, where he became headmaster of Waterford Kamslava. All four children attended the school, and I've repeatedly told Dad that his decision to come to WK was life-changing for us all and had a massive impact on who we were to become and the work that we would all choose to do. 
So began a long relationship with the school on the hill that has also seen recently a third generation of Jenningses being involved with the school. Today we'll reflect on Dad's time at WK. But a whole generation of children passed through the school while under his leadership until 1984. During his tenure, WK became a member of the United World Colleges movement, broadening its focus and purpose to use education as a force to unite people, nations and cultures for peace and a sustainable future. Dad left WK and returned to South Africa to continue to make a difference and was appointed the director of Vulega Trust from 1984 to 1998. The special focus of Vulega has always been on youth development and leadership programs, and the organization ran the notable National Youth Leadership Training Program, in which Athol played an instrumental role. Under his leadership during the late 1980s, the organization sought to work with youth in schools and started the Community Service in Schools program, which saw the growth and development of young teens in school. Bulega was also very involved in conflict resolution and mediation in the province, and Dad was an active member of an informal ecumenical body known as the Natal Church Leaders Group, who were involved in various mediation and peace initiatives in the province to avert a bloody crisis arising from the tensions between the Encarta Freedom Party and the United Democratic Front. In 1998, Ethel left Vulega Trust and moved to the little town of Clarence in the Eastern Free State. Ostensibly to retire, he continued to actively contribute to community development. He was the driving force behind Bana Ba Shokang, an initiative of a network of churches in Clarence, caring for orphans and vulnerable children. Its aim was first of all to ensure that no child in the community would go hungry, and secondly, to achieve this goal in ways which will encourage hope, dignity, and a sense of belonging. Dad was instrumental in establishing the center to upon a place of hope. The building includes a large multi-purpose hall kitchens, toilets, washing facilities at the one side, and smaller meeting rooms in a library at the other. The Place of Hope has become a hive of activity, meeting the needs of youth in the area. And at the age of 80, Dad graduated cum laude, having undertaken a counselling degree through UNISA to enable him to mentor counsellors for Tsipong more effectively. Dad was also chairperson of the Clarence Village Conservancy for a number of years and initiated a number of educational interventions to work with the village and surrounding communities to cultivate an attitude of use instead of abuse for the beautiful environment in which the town is located. Dad was many things to many people, but to us, he was just Dad. He lived a full and long life driven by his desire to make a difference in the lives of other people and guided by a strong faith and belief system that was centered around the intrinsic value of each and every human being. I've been blessed over the last few years to have spent a lot of time with him, exploring and sharing our experiences in the journey of life. His daily meditations and readings that he received from Richard Raw's Center for Action and Contemplation became a focal point for these discussions in recent times. The readings in the month before he died were particularly apt and encapsulated much of what Dad was all about. They dealt with the concept of engaged Christianity at a time when the world is just seemingly on fire. They drew comparisons between those for whom Christianity is an evacuation plan how to get your soul out of earth and into heaven, rather than a transformation plan, how to help God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Dad was an engaged Christian, but he could just as easily have been an engaged Buddhist, an engaged Muslim, or an engaged something else. 
I leave you with a few of the guiding principles for living a just and engaged life, which sum up how Dad lived his life and provide example of how we should all live our lives. Lifelong learning is one of them. Do not think that the knowledge you presently possess is changeless, complete, or the absolute truth. Love. Do not maintain anger or hatred. Make love your highest goal. Nonviolence. Do not kill and do no harm. And don't stand by when others seek to do so. Find creative, just and non-violent ways to prevent or end conflicts and to promote and strengthen peace. Gentleness. Don't force others, including children, by any means whatsoever to adopt your views, whether by authority, threat, money, propaganda, or even education. And finally, serenity. Don't lose yourself in dispersion or in your surroundings. Yes, dwell in the presence and peace of God, but come back to what is happening in the present moment. Be in touch with what is wondrous, refreshing, and healing both inside and around you. Ambagasya, Dad. Your presence will be sorely missed.
Uh, Mike Linden, if you could share with us, please. Thank you. First of all, thank you to the Jennings family for that beautiful tribute. Um, I'm still choking a little bit because it moved me very deeply. I'd like to begin by saying how much of a privilege it is to have been asked to speak in honor of a man whom I admired and greatly respected, a man whose deep modesty and whose commitment to the teams he built meant that he very often did not get the full credit for all that he achieved, and particularly for all that he achieved for Waterford Gunklava. I doubt whether there's anybody now, apart from Tom Friend and myself, who is fully aware of the immensity of the task Athel fa faced when he succeeded Michael Stern. Tom more so than I, because I didn't return to WK until the fifth year of Athel's headship. Michael was a charismatic visionary with an extraordinary gift for attracting support for his vision. His energy, his drive, his absolute commitment in the concept, context of starting a new and radical school from scratch were, I think, unique. No one can question his success in establishing the school in the face of tremendous odds. But without in any way detracting from the immense contributions of those who started the school with him, it all depended on him. Michael was a man who seized each opportunity as it arose, carried others with him, and used whatever resources were available, and even some resources which weren't yet available, um, to build on his vision. But again, it all depended on him. And the structures which would give assurance of permanence were really pretty fragile, particularly when it came to finance. Athol had to make huge changes to the institutional mindset. Few of us on the staff and even on governing council realized just how thin was the ice which supported us. Athol himself regarded five steps taken under his leadership as his most valuable and lasting contributions to the school. These were genuine full gender equality within the school, the formalization of the community service program, admission to membership of the United World Colleges, the introduction of the International Baccalaureate, and the setting up and development of a sustainable financial structure, which provided the foundation for growth and development. I would add another two. The establishment of a much more broadly inclusive and consultative style of leadership and management, and a greater attention to a thoroughly professionally developed teaching and administrative staff. Gender equality. The first girl, Lonka Gedge, was soon joined by a number of other pioneers. But most of us recognized that despite his efforts, by the time Michael Stern left the school, WK was still very much a boys' school with some girls. Athol realized that drastic changes would have to be made in order to achieve full gender equality. Despite intense and sometimes underhanded opposition from some among the staff, he won the support to make those changes. At the beginning of 1978, the first milestone was reached when the girls outnumbered the boys by one. I think even more important though, was the election by students and staff that year of a girl, Nkuni Ambezi, for, as, uh, to be head of school for the following year. That reflected a widespread and genuine change of attitude in the school. 
It's not easy to assess Athol's impact in terms of the relative importance of every separate innovation that he introduced. And perhaps it's not even sensible to try to do so. However, it would be quite easy to overlook just what an impact his critique of our raison d'etre had. Michael Stern was always insistent that the school's objective was to provide the best possible education in suited to the world this, our students would go into. Opposition to apartheid was part of that, but not everything. However, in time, Waterford came to be very largely defined and to define itself by being against apartheid with the consequent danger of a degree of smug self-satisfaction and of ignoring other pressing issues. Athol's insight was that the school needed not only to be against something, but even more importantly, to be for something. Building a structured, effective and reflective community service program and adopting the values of the United World Colleges provided this positivity. Purposeful, purposeful designed interaction between individuals leads to understanding of others, including their values, their aspirations, and their limitations. In turn, this develops into understanding between groups and communities, and perhaps even between nations. Service had always been part of the school's ethos, but I thought took effective steps to elevate its status, to make it equivalent with the academic, and to ensure the widest possible involvement, to make it an integral component of the curriculum. He asked me in to come back in 1979 and build the structure program and he gave me every possible support and encouragement as I did so. On a very personal note, this was the most exciting, interesting and fulfilling part of my teaching career. And I remain immensely great, grateful to Ethel for having made it possible. Joining the UAWC movement opened doors towards broadening and deepening the education offered to students by embracing internationalism, multiculturalism, and a more expansive curriculum. The battle to demonstrate that racial separation was an aberration, it had been won by now. The exception had become the norm. And now the school was moving on under Athol's leadership to the next challenge. The United World Colleges enable young people to recognize and to combat all forms of discrimination in all parts of the world. It was very much an opportunity for the expansion of Waterford's work. Athol took the first and most essential step towards financial stability by appointing the girls the school's first financially qualified bursa, Ton Frint. And not only appointing him, but as was typical of Athol, giving him the scope and the authority to exercise control. Previously, any funds raised were spent immediately either on bursaries, and that was seen as a cornerstone of the school's ethos, and not to be compromised, or on the building of new facilities. Subsequently, money was set aside every year to build up reserves in case of emergencies and to deal with unbudgeted expenses. Longer term fundraising strategies were developed, which led to greater returns and enabled the introduction of a financial model which would ensure security and sustainability. As a head, Athol believed implicitly in the necessity of discussion, consultation, and to the fullest extent 
extent possible, the achievement of consensus. That, he was convinced, was in the long run the most effective form of management. A policy or a project was far more likely to succeed if the majority had bought into it. Of course, this could become quite a lengthy process and people who were used to quicker forms of decision-making sometimes became pretty impatient with it. The introduction of a greater degree of financial control did not immediately result in a gush of money, of course. Things remained tight, and this certainly restricted the opportunities for staff development. But what opportunities could be provided were made available and staff strongly encouraged to use them. I was the most obvious beneficiary of this in a demonstration of the school's commitment to community service. I was given a year's paid leave to spend at the University of East Anglia to reflect on the first three years of the program and to see what could be learned from other programs. As a person, Athel was unfailingly considerate, always ready to listen, giving generously of his time and of his ability. Perhaps what I remember best about him is his gentleness. But no one could make the error of confusing gentleness with weakness. The years of discipline it had taken to reach an Olympic and national championship standard as an athlete were always apparent. There was steel there, derived also from his commitment to bringing justice and charity and compassion to all the many, many people he served for whom he embodied the concept of the servant leader. A pastor in the broadest sense, not one who pre preached his faith, but one who lived it. Waterford Gunplover was indeed extremely fortunate in its second head. Humbergatli Earth. Thank you.
sharing um, those words with us and to the Jennings family for sharing with us as well. We now invite Tom Brent to give his remarks. Tom. Tom, Tom, if you could unmute, please. Thank you, Jackie, for the privilege of speaking today at Ethel's Botford Kamplaba Memorial. Thank you, Mike, for setting the record on Ethel Strait. Thank you, Ross, for your contribution and <clears throat> the life of Ethel. Being number three in the list, a number of my items have been taken out, but I still try to emphasize some of them that were already mentioned. Ethel took over an exceptional and incredible daring experiment by Michael Stern, establishing from scratch a multiracial school that had become an icon against the struggle of apartheid. Not a small feat in a not so friendly neighborhood. Remember in those days, apartheid in South Africa, liberation wars in Mozambique, Angola, Rhodesia. How would I describe Ethel? Difficult after everything that has been said so far, but let me try and first ask Mankoba to put up the clouds, the word cloud from the family memorial, which gives a picture of how Ethel was seen by family and friends. Mankoba. Well, whilst he is finding that one, <clears throat> I counted 40 attributes onto that one. And so it is difficult to find any more, but I will add a few. Ethel was reserved, quiet, listening person with the highest level of integrity, approachable, never openly angry, always available for advice and pastoral care, never complaining, always positive, a special person. Not a saint by any means. He was not averse to controversies. Here is an example. Ethel never told you what to do. Instead, he spelled out options for you to make the decision yourself. Many of the teaching staff didn't appreciate this approach. They expected the principal to tell them what to do instead of being given the task of taking the decision and taking the responsibility thereof. On an ethical front, I'd like to give another example. At some point in time, there was a disciplinary process at the school after six boys, <coughs> sorry about that, were detected in the girls' dorm after light by the night watchman. Ethel stepped back from the hearing because one of his sons was one of the six. A little bit of historical and political background. Ethel started his time at Waterford with great political uncertainty in Swaziland after the constitution had been set aside by King Sabuza in 1973. This in a new nation, six years after independence. Later in 1982, when King Sabuza died, another period of great uncertainty. This time with the succession to the throne. Some prominent, respected people were incarcerated. Ethel, regularly visited one of them 
in the Matsapa Max Maximum Security Prison as part of his pastoral duties. I think Mike has said enough about Ethel's commitment to change the attitude of people at Waterford from being against something which he saw as not wrong, but what was more important to be a force for something and finding a solution to the problem. An example of that, Ethel introduced the idea that the school should be involved in inviting sports teams from the white schools in South Africa to show that there's nothing wrong with multiracial schools. <clears throat> Jackie mentioned, <clears throat> ah, well, here's Montoba's um, contribution. And I've counted those 40 attributes of Ethel, and you can probably find one that really fits yourself. Except I'm intrigued by the one about ice cream, but I will taste that later myself here in Tom. <clears throat> Let's go back to the screen and deal with what Jackie had to say about Ethel. Ethel's legacy as a visionary leader and a trailblazer in education has left an indelible mark on our institution. I think Mike Linden has made that very clear already. But maybe there are still some things that he hasn't mentioned and I would like to bring to your attention. <clears throat> About joint decision-making, Ethel introduced a management team consisting of the senior academic master, the head of hostels, the head of junior school, and a bursar for weekly discussions and joint decision-making. Another aspect of Ethel, and you heard it already in what was said about him, Ethel introduced a daily meal for the support staff, that is the maintenance, domestic, laundry, kitchen, science lab assistants, <clears throat> for them to have a meal on the school. Admittedly, at that time, still at their workplace. Years later, the support staff was given access to the students' CAF, the dining hall, for their midday meal. Yes, we're talking about the 1970s, 50 years ago. That was also emancipation at Waterford. Mike spoke about the introduction of the UWC, and I like to mention that the UWC office sought Waterford not the other way around. Waterford was invited to join and governing council after quite some deliberations, decided in 1981, as Mike said. Mike also spoke about the International Baccalaureate, which was part of the changeover. And I like to add that understandably, a changeover in curriculum from the A-level to the IB <coughs> created quite a bit of resistance from the staff. Understandably, I mean, here was a totally new approach to education. And the British parents in town were also not very happy about it. Another struggle that Ethel had to fight was the I IB exams. The office was set basically in the Northern Hemisphere for Northern Hemisphere schools. And it took Ethel a long and hard struggle with the IB office to accept that the school year in the Southern Hemisphere needed exams in November. And you know the result that happened over time. Mike Linden has spoken about community service. And I would just like to add one thing there, and that is at some point in time, the Armand Hammer UWC sent a film team over to Swaziland to make a film of Waterford, and they called it Lesson of Peace. When this film was shown at the next UWC headmasters meeting, it became the talking point 
of the day and was seen as a blueprint for ComServe at the UWC colleges. Congratulations, Mike and Ethel. <clears throat> Ethel was open to different ideas. The staff didn't feel that the Swazi community was represented well enough at the school and suggested that they would go to rural schools to identify promising students and give them guidance in passing the entrance test to the school. Ethel supported this initiative fully. On gender equality, Michael has already given all the information, except one thing. According to Tony Hatton, the first girl happened to be accepted in the school unbeknown to governing council. And in fact, in 1966, the governing council meeting state, Waterford Kamslava will remain a boys' school. Our times have changed. And the parity Mike spoke about as well, but he didn't mention that apparently in the staff meeting, there was great controversy about the idea that the students had elected a head girl. A head girl in a boys' school, or what used to be a boys' school. The staff wanted a new election to have a boy elected next to the head girl. As so stated, how could a democratic, <coughs> apologies for that, um, how can we be part of overturning a democratic process? In other words, the election by the students. A lot of debating took place, and Mike probably may remember this, and in the end, <coughs> gender equality was reached with the acceptance of Anku Niambezi as the head of school. Mike mentioned about the bursaries, and I'd like to emphasize that at the time, the acceptance into the school never interfered with parents' ability to pay. If a child was accepted, a bursary would be offered, and as Ethel was adamant, that we will find the money. Mike mentioned a bursary endowment fund, and for that, Ethel was an ardent fundraiser. There were many innovations during Ethel's time, and just to put people's minds back to the 1980s, there were no computers around, but Ethel managed through the George Soros foundation to have Apple computers introduced at Waterford and arrange for training of teachers so that the maximum benefit would be derived. There was professionalization of the catering services and included that was the modernization of kitchen and in particular the laundry equipment. That in those days looked more like a Chinese laundry than anything else that one would expect at the modern school. <clears throat> Computerization was further extended to the accounts of the school and I can vouch what a difference that made. As far as the building program, new science lecture rooms were uh, built, a sick bay was, in, uh, was added to the infrastructure north-facing classrooms in those cold, cold, cold <coughs> concrete bunkers that had been put up as original classrooms, <coughs> a music center, a multi-purpose hall, and of course, some additional staff housing. <coughs> Ross alerted to Ethel and Pets leaving Waterford for Durban after their 10 year um, term at the school, and they did a lot in terms of the churches and conflict resolution. At the 50th anniversary, when Ethel spoke about the highlights of his time, he ended with the words to the students that present, 
WK story is significant. You were part of it. The task is yours to carry this experiment forward. He finished with the words, I'm thankful to all guarantors who helped me. May I close with a thank you to Ethel for the experience and the privilege of working with him for those eight years at Waterford, this special institution. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for those kind words. I'd like to invite Andy Cruz, who is a former student and also represents the Governing Council to make his remarks. Andy, please. Thank you. And more is great. I'm honoring him. And to the Jennings family, I extend my truly sincere condolences. I know that Athol's passing leaves a deep void in your lives, and my heart aches for you. Other speakers today have already shared memories of Athol from their perspectives of being family members, friends, and colleagues. And as Jackie just been asked to speak, both as a former student and a current governing council member. Let me start with this. Obviously, I can't speak for all students, and I probably shouldn't even try to speak for the full governing council. But let me say this. As a student, it's generally pretty difficult to be impressed by a head of school. And that's because heads of school are part of your simple daily reality. They're the ones who lead assembly, preside over special functions, and help students get back on the path of good behavior when they've strayed. As a student, on top of all this general, these general uh, factors about being a, a head of school, um, Ethel himself made it even more difficult for me to come up with anecdotes. And that's because he was a quiet man. He did not seek the limelight. He was not looking for personal accolades. He did not have to be the center of attention. And so when I look back through my teenage memories and I was looking for anecdotes that I could share, I really came up empty in terms of ones that I could offer you to say, now there was a great head of school. Fortunately, with 40 years of hindsight and some experience being a governing council member, I now see a slew of things that I failed to appreciate as a student. Sure, I lived them, but I didn't have the perspective to appreciate them fully at the time. The first reflection I'd like to share in that regard is that Athol was a champion of student empowerment. He gave space to students to make significant decisions for themselves and to pursue matters that were deeply important to them. One example that's been mentioned already and which I'd like to elaborate on a little bit is that of sports to us. As many of you remember in the 1970s and 80s, a number of international governing bodies for sport boycotted South Africa including both the Olympic movement and the governing bodies for international rugby and cricket. At the time, Waterford periodically had sporting ties with South African schools. And so the international boycott posed a question to the school. What are you, Waterford Conflava, going to do about this? And there were three basic options. We could continue our sporting relationships with South African schools, particularly white ones, in the hope that engaging with our multiracial teams would open white students' eyes and perhaps change their minds for the future. Or two, we could boycott going to South Africa, but we could invite schools to visit us in the hope that seeing multiracial education in action would be a powerful persuader for the future. Or third, we could embrace the boycott fully as much of the rest of the world did. And certainly as I remember as a student, Athel left that decision with us as the students. At his direction, the school engaged in discussions. We had town halls. We even were allowed to use classroom time to talk about these options and what we as students thought was going to be the best thing to do. Now pause for a moment and think about what's embedded in that. Because what it meant was that Athel and the leadership team he assembled believed that students were difficult issues. It meant Athol trusted that students would reach a reasonable decision. And it reflected a philosophy of education 
it suggested that education is far more than book learning and academic prowess, but also included skills and developing things such as the ability to speak with and also listen to others, even when their point of view differed from your own. It included, excuse me, it included also um, the trust that developing skills and learning through serving your community will expand young people's minds. And it also includes the importance of taking responsibility for your own future. This philosophy, which is quite familiar today, was really not that common at the time, and we were all enriched by it. In a similar vein, when Soweto erupted in June 16, 1976, and the South African security forces slaughtered dozens of student protesters. Waterford Conclava students wanted to protest themselves and wanted to march to the also border with South Africa in solidarity. Waterford Conclava as an institution for safety and pragmatic reasons did not issue any formal statement about the slaughter. But Athel Jennings himself drove representatives of the students' bodies, the student body to the police station so that the students could seek permission for the march. He understood the students' passion. He understood their need for action. And he did what he personally could to support them, while at the same time taking steps to guard their safety. And also, as a third example, as Tom and Mike both mentioned, Athel presided over that phase of switching from having a head boy to the first year when Nguru Yembezi was selected as the first head girl. And the, the, the finer point that I wanted to add to that is that as we understood it afterwards, there were in fact adults in the school who wanted to add a head boy to sit next to Nkuru as head girl and Athel resisted. And I think in that action, he made a very important point about the place of girls in the school and more broadly in society. These are just three ways that Alpha uh, thoughtfully steered the ethos of the school to one that gave increasing levels of autonomy and responsibility to students as they matured and provided myriad ways for students to explore their interests and passions. Today, we equip our students with the tools, understanding, and sense of purpose to become agents of change, committed to working for justice in Africa and the world beyond. Looking back, I see the deep roots of this special mission in Athel's leadership and the support of the team he assembled. As also mentioned already, in addition to being a champion of student empowerment, Athel led Waterford Conclava through two major changes, joining the United World College movement and replacing the Cambridge A-levels with the International Baccalaureate as the highest level of certification available at the school. Time doesn't allow me, and I'm sure you don't want me to, explore the advantages that Atlas saw in adopting the IB or joining the UWC movement. But what I think is, however, and Tom remarked on this, these changes were not uniformly popular at the time. Indeed, they were controversial. Parents and staff both questioned the wisdom of abandoning, abandoning the known and respected Cambridge A-levels for an unknown and still growing educational program. But Apple believes strongly in the core precepts of the IB system, including encouraging students to think critically and to challenge assumptions. Likewise, he saw value in joining an international movement of schools that sought to use education as a force to unite people nations and cultures for peace and a sustainable future. And here's the critical part. It could have been far easier to continue doing things the same way they've been done for the previous 15 years. But Athel didn't take the easy way. Instead, Athel committed to the hard task of making changes that would benefit the entire WK community, not just at the time, but in the future. He collaborated with staff, the governing council and other stakeholders, first to strike the new course, and then second to undertake the difficult work of implementing change. It was disruptive. 
It caused turbulence. It was uncomfortable. It even meant, in some cases, personnel changes. But Athel did not shy away from these challenges. And this is what I, today, as a governing council member, appreciate deeply. Athel's decade at Waterford provides a powerful example of how leadership is forward-looking and based on core values. It entails having the courage of your convictions and making hard decisions. And leadership means, when necessary, enduring pain and periods of challenge, while at the same time collaborating with and supporting the community as it moves forward. Thank you, Athel, for your many gifts to all of us and for your wisdom. Your impact in the world carry forward by every new cohort of WK students is unending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for your thoughts and those words that you have shared with everybody. And we say at this juncture, may his soul rest in peace. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you all, our speakers, and the audience that has joined us from every corner of this world. Thank you for being here today and for honoring the legacy of Arthur James. We thank you and we wish you well. Stay well and God bless. Goodbye.